Hi, I'm Danielle Dufo, and you're watching Animal Logic. Twenty twenty five was an amazing year for paleontology. There were lots of new findings that deepened our understanding of some species, and totally new discoveries that introduced us to whole new species. Forty four new species were discovered, almost one a week. We know it's basically a full time job to keep track of all these discoveries, so we're doing the work for you and showing you some of the biggest discoveries that you might have missed. Let's start with the kings, the Tyrannosaurids. We have a brand new North American killer, the Nanotyrannus. Nanotyrannus was for a long time thought to be just a young T Rex. They lived at the same place, at the same time and looked pretty similar, except that Nanotyrannus was much smaller. Of course, at the time, or at least until now, we didn't know what the entire growth stages of Tyrannosaurus were, so the assumption that it could have been a young T-Rex was also quite valid. Their fossil record shows that it was about 5 meters long and weighed about 700 kilograms. Pretty giant compared to us, but next to a T-Rex, it looked like a little minion. For comparison, T-Rex was over twice as long and was 10 times as heavy. But back in October, in a paper by Zano and Napoli, it was revealed that a specimen once believed to be a young T-Rex was a totally different species. An incredible specimen called the dueling dinosaurs was discovered in 2006. Unfortunately, it was not in a museum repository and it was privately owned. So, until kind of recently, this specimen was not accessible for study. But that has all changed, as you can see by this scientific study by Zano et al. The dueling dinosaurs is this fantastic and complete fossil preservation of a triceratops totally intertwined with what looks like a juvenile T-Rex, or maybe a young or teen T-Rex? Some people argued that it was just a juvenile T-Rex. Others argued that its features were completely new and that it deserved its own name. They proposed Nanotyrannus. And trust me, fires have started over this. <laughs> to add fuel to the fire, because of course there's more, another skeleton was discovered that was assumed to be a juvenile or teen T-Rex. Teen Rex? Teen Rex. And it was called Jane. So this new paper by Zano and Napoli claims that it's got a few main points that make it indisputable that this creature could not have possibly grown into a full-grown T-Rex. So let's go over those real quick. So one, they did histology on the limb bones of this dinosaur because it was finally in their access and they granted themselves the right to be able to cut it. There's a lot of ways to do this pretty non-destructively these days, so don't cry for the bones. They'll be fine. Anyway, by doing thin sections of the bones, they found that there's growth rings inside that indicate a full-grown individual. These growth rings were tightly packed, which means that year after year, you can kind of see that growth slow down. And once it reaches adulthood, the growth rings basically stop. It had all of those features. How do you fight that? It's like cutting down a tree. Point number two is that it had more tooth sockets than a T-Rex. And I mean like any of the T-Rex skulls ever discovered at any stage of growth. These ones in particular, it didn't match up. And these things are something that gets, you know, cemented in your skull from a very, very young developmental age. So also pretty hard to fight. Number three is that the pathways of the nerves and the sinuses in the skull they really didn't follow the same paths as any of the T-Rexes that they analyzed. They dug deep for this info. They had to CT scan these skulls and compare it to the CT scans of a bunch of other T-Rexes. I've done CT scan work. It's not quick, it's not easy, but it is worth it. And the evidence doesn't lie. The bone don't lie. And for another point, the arms were longer and thinner than any other known T-Rex specimen, at least relatively to their body size. So something was fishy, and it sounds like some people had the right idea all along. Not gonna say who. You know who you are. And it wasn't just Nanotyrannus that came onto the scene, it brought its whole fam. 
the different Nanotyrannus specimens were split into two species, Nanotyrannus lancensis, which is the one that I got to see in the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, and the other member of the Nanotyrannus family was Jane. So no longer a young T-Rex, but a Nanotyrannus lathaeus, its own species. So really, it's a twofer in terms of new dinos. And just a few weeks later, another paper came out adding even more certainty to this new theory. And they did it by going for the throat. These researchers noticed that in birds and in non-avian dinosaurs, the hyoid bone, so the bone that your tongue attaches to and helps control the ligaments and muscles, it starts out very soft in life and gets ossified as the animal matures. So luckily, the specimen had a preserved hyoid, which is really very rare. And the researchers could tell that it was from a mature dinosaur because it was bone, it was ossified. Hey. I was wrong about this for the longest time, and I don't have any issue saying that. Like, I also didn't know any better, but to me it just made more sense for this to be a young T-Rex, because that's all we really knew of Tyrannosaurids in Hell Creek. Sometimes you just need the right amount of context and information to make a better analysis. That's science. That's science, baby. The cool thing about this is that it tells us that the T-Rex ecosystem had multiple predators of different sizes. It was much more ecologically complex than we ever knew. Kind of makes me wonder. At some point, a growing T-Rex would be the same size as Nano Tyrannus. Probably a little beefier though. Really, I wonder if they could play. I wonder if they did play. Or who ate who. That's probably play to them too. Staying in the family, but headed all the way over to Mongolia, where a new Tyrannosaurid taught us about the evolution of the coolest animal to ever live. This was Khan Kulu, which means the Dragon Prince. The fossils had been discovered in 1972 and were thought to belong to Electrosaurus, clearly an electric type dinosaur. But new research on them shows that it was a new dinosaur. Khan Kulu lived about 30 million years before T Rex first appeared on the scene. At this time, Tyrannosaurids were smaller and nimbler. The Dragon Prince was only about 4 meters long, no big deal, and weighed about 700 kilograms. But its long, thin legs and relatively pointy snout show us what ancestors of T-Rex probably looked like. It also tells us that T-Rex's ancestors were likely Asian dinosaurs that migrated to North America. Speaking of Mongolian, small, old versions of famous dinosaurs, this was also the year we discovered the oldest known pachycephalosaur. I'm just gonna say for a second, I love pachycephalosaurs. I think they're one of the most intriguing and unknown groups of dinosaurs that ever lived. I mean, look at those big domes. They're beautiful. Mwah. And so spiky. They look like little dragons. I love them. And their teeth? What a mystery, really. Okay, anyway, back on track. Its name was Zabacephaly, which basically means OG old head. They lived around 110 million years ago and were about the size of a Canada goose. Aw, imagine Canada geese headbutting each other into submission or to impress the, the goose ladies. Cute. This discovery showed us the early stage of Pachycephalosaurian evolution. That's a big deal. We've known so little about their evolution all this time. They were already headbanging for a long time by the time the massive Pachycephalosaurus showed up. It's amazing to look at these ancient animals and wonder what their lives were like. But it's also important to think about how the animals around us are living. That means there are over 9 billion animals living in poor conditions in facilities with huge environmental impacts. You don't have to be a vegetarian to see that the conditions these animals live in are unacceptable. I'm an occasional meat eater, but I don't want animals to suffer. But is there anything that we can do about it? That's where FarmKind, the sponsor of today's video, comes in. They work with experts to research and vet charities that help protect factory farmed animals. Each dollar given goes directly to charities who then help as many animals as they can. I love how FarmKind's website explains exactly how your donation goes to helping our furry friends. 
They calculate what kind of impact your money will have. Like donating just $15 a month can help almost 350 animals a year. A misconception I always had was that the only way to help factory farmed animals is by changing your diet. But that's not entirely the case. FarmKind has a compassion calculator to figure out how much you'd need to donate to offset your diet. I was able to input mine and see what my offset looks like. Turns out if I donate $18 a month, that would do more good than if I stopped buying animal products altogether. And because FarmKind is grant funded, they won't take a cut out of your donation, meaning 100% of what you give goes straight to their recommended charities that are freeing millions of animals from cruelty and developing new food systems for a better future. If you'd like to donate, even just a small amount, check out the link in the description. And if you use my code, AnimalLogic, your donation will get a 50% boost from pledges by large donors. So check them out, I'm sure you'll be impressed. A world with kinder farm animal treatment and better environmental practices protects all wildlife around us, including the living dinosaurs, like the chickens and all the wild birds flapping around. We'll get back to new dinos in a minute, but let's mention some of the coolest discoveries that researchers made about known species. As a secret goth, my favorite is naturally the dino mummies. Yep. You heard right, 66 million years ago, an Edmontosaurus died in a puddle of mud. Then there was a flash flood and the body got covered in sediment, which created a thin layer of minerals. Even after the flesh rotted away, the clay mask preserved amazing details of the dino. These are the oldest known hooves of any vertebrate, even though it's very likely that some older dinos or animals before dinos might have had them too. Besides what they looked like, we might have also learned how to tell the males and females apart. And the clues are all in the tail. New research by Bartozzo et al. pointed out that a lot of Edmontosaurus had bones that had been broken and healed. Now these are the neural spines, so the, the top projection along the spine that creates those like, those tall finger-like sail looking things that support the muscle in the tail. That's what was getting broken, not the actual vertebrae themselves. So that led to a question, why was just the top of the back of the tail getting broken? And by the back of the tail, I mean like hip area, right up close to the hips there. What was going on? Any ideas? Turns out that male hadrosaurs weren't just heartbreakers, they might have also been backbreakers. The males, after all, weighed about three tons, so a male mounting a female could have done some damage, especially if the female wasn't full grown. I can think of a few animals today where the males far outgrow the females, and sometimes the females' lives are put at risk through the process of mating. I'm thinking elephant seals. Now that's scary. Were they the elephant seals of the Cretaceous? Maybe. The other cool thing about this, though, is the incredible capacity to heal for these dinosaurs. We don't know how often they were mating, not at all, but we know that if there was a high chance of them breaking their backs every time they did it, they would have to heal pretty darn fast to live another day, especially when being chased down by T-Rex, but also Nanotyrannus. Hell Creek was a scary place. Back onto dino feet, their tracks are important because they tell us a lot about their behavior as dinos. Another one of the coolest discoveries this year was that some dinosaurs moved in mixed herds, kind of like zebras and wildebeest today. The basis for this was trackways found in Dinosaur Provincial Park in Alberta, Canada. The tracks were dated to be around 76 million years old and showed ceratopsians walking alongside ankylosaurids. T-Rex tracks were also found, which suggests that these mixed herds could have been formed for protection. Honestly, that's extremely cool because you've got all kinds of different forms of weapons, like the ankylosaurs are protecting from the back, but then you can have a whole phalanx formation of these horned dinosaurs around the front and sides. Yeah, I, that's how I would arrange them. 
The small caveat is that we can't know for sure if the tracks were made at the same time or within hours or even days of each other. But at the very least, they give us amazing clues of how these dinosaurs interacted with each other. Now I want to see dinosaurs doing like Banjo-Kazooie. Can we find proof of Banjo-Kazooie dinosaurs? That'd be really cool. In terms of sheer numbers, the biggest discovery of the year was probably the finding of over 20,000 dinosaur tracks in the Italian Alps. The tracks are now in steep parts of the mountain, an awesome reminder of the shifting nature of the Earth. But when they were made, they were on tidal flatlands, and large groups of prosauropods walked along them. This happened during the Triassic, about 200 million years ago, and all we have to do to see them is climb a steep rocky mountain in the Italian Alps. See you there? Now let's do a rapid fire round of new species and what we know about them. Duonychus was a therizinosaurid, but instead of the iconic three claws, it only had two. It gave us extra evidence that this was one of the weirdest groups to ever live. Chatty Titan, obviously the chattest of titans, was a member of the South American giants, the titanosaurids. This was kind of the runt of the family, at just about seven meters or roughly the size of a giraffe. Aw, a dinosaur teen titan. Then we have Spicomelis. Like, what are we even looking at here? They were short, spiky, and had a flat back, but they were like walking iron maidens. It is the oldest known ankylosaurid and lived roughly 168 million years ago in Africa. It had spines on its sides, giant spines on its neck, spines on its tail, and even spines on its spine. The ribs themselves had spines, making it the only known animal ever to have these features. What were they so afraid of? Oh yeah, theropods. Kicking it a little bit more old school, we have the Huayra Cursor Jaguensis. These dinos lived at the beginning of the dino era, over 220 million years ago. At first glance, you'd think that they're just your regular bipedal herbivore. But amazingly, they belonged to the group that would eventually evolve into sauropods. You can kind of see the long neck here starting to hint at that lifestyle. One of their descendants would be Astygnosaurus genuflexa, a newly discovered South American giant. Their knees bent forwards, and it used its powerful muscles to actively move and stand around. It wasn't like a horse that could just lock its knees. This was a new discovery for giant sauropods, which had been assumed to have stiff knees to support their weight. But nope, some of them were much more flexible than we ever thought, and could take a knee if they wanted. So, with weekly discoveries, we can't mention every single new dino, but these are the highlights. 2026 will for sure be a new year of amazing research, and we will be here to tell you about the most amazing discoveries. And let us know in the comments about any stories that we might have missed, or what you're mad about, what you're happy about, what you loved. So what should we talk about next? Please let me know in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe for new episodes every week. Thanks for watching. See ya! See ya! Don't forget to check out our sponsor, FarmKind, to help improve the lives of millions of animals. You can make a difference. Welcome to the kinds of dinosaurs. You got the long kinds, and you got the stand-up guy kinds, and you've got the necky guys, and the honky boys. Scissor hand guy. Yeah, yeah. Head button. <laughs> The duck guys, the, those, those dang frilly guys. Uh, I'm a, uh, a porcupine turtle guy. Yeah. Can't, can't trust him. Can't trust him.